Folks, welcome to week three of DMD 100, Intro to Digital Media Design. All right, let's take a look and see what we're doing this week. We'll go down to our modules, go down to week three, take a look at the week three overview. All right, so this week we are going to take a closer look, which is not meant to be a pun, I promise, uh, at one of the tenets of visual literacy. We are going over uh, about eight different visual literacy areas in the course of the semester. So this week we are going to take uh, a closer look at seeing versus looking, uh, which is a deconstruction of the visual shorthand that is so deeply embedded into our collective subconscious, an exploration of that love triangle between your brain, your eyes, and the rest of the body. We go through life seeing lots of lots of things uh, and looking at lots of things, but how closely do we look at these things? Do we really take the time to try to critically think as we are looking at it? And so we're going to do that today. So we're going to sort of take a deeper dive into that difference between seeing versus looking. Um, in the consumables this week, read, view, listen, do, you have this video to watch here. This is from Cave Drawings to Emojis. It is a TED Talk, uh, which sort of goes over man's uh, long history of trying to communicate visually. Uh, this will come in handy uh, when we get to pictograms and icons, but it also uh, goes over sort of the general desire of mankind to try to communicate uh, in a way that is visual, you know, verbal language was around uh, for a long time and evolved over time. But at the same time, so did visual language, which of course eventually became written language. And so this gets into that history and talks about why it's so important for humans to be able to communicate in these different modalities, um, not just sort of one way. Uh, we have an assignment this week. We have a discussion board assignment, which is an all-week assignment. You have all week to work on it. It's due at the end of the week. We'll go over that in a second. And uh, also due this week is a section of our semester-long project, uh, our deconstruction, reconstruction of a movie or television show to eventually make a title sequence out of. So step one of that project is due at the end of this week. We're going to review that as well. Okay, so first things first, let's take a look at the whole seeing versus looking, and we'll talk about uh, what that is all about. So let's take a look over here. So the seeing versus looking is tying directly into our discussion board, and we're going to do so by doing a little analysis of a painting by this guy, Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio. Now, he is most famously just known by his last name, Caravaggio. He was an Italian painter, uh, active uh, in Rome, Naples, Malta, and Sicily from around the early, early 1590s to approximately 1610 when he died. Uh, his paintings combine a very realistic observation of the human state, uh, realistic in terms of both physical representation, in terms of anatomy, in terms of clothing, uh, in terms of type of human representation. A lot of human representation in uh, early Renaissance painting uh, was idealized, um, and so Caravaggio's work is not idealized. His people look like everyday people. They look like the type of people that you would normally run into. In fact, he used realistic uh, figure models from just everyday people off the street in his paintings, which he was actually criticized for because he was not showing the human form in its idealized state. He was showing it as humans actually look. His paintings combine this uh, realistic observation of the human state, both physical and emotional, uh, with a dramatic use of lighting, uh, which had a very formative influence on Baroque painting, which was another uh, artistic movement of the time. And so it was meant to be more realistic, almost hyper-realistic. The lighting was very dramatic. He tried to catch it, capture the inner emotions of humans in his painting. And he also was very good at leaving a space for the viewer in his painting uh, to both interpret what is going on in the story and to physically feel as though you could be a part of the painting as the viewer. Uh, he was orphaned at a very young age. Uh, he was basically grew up on the streets. He had a very violent temper, which got him into a lot of fights. Uh, in 1606, uh, shortly before he died, he actually had to flee Rome uh, because he murdered somebody. He r r r uh, murdered this guy, Renuccio Tomasino. Uh, Tomasino. Uh, anyway, I can't pronounce his last name. My wife would be very upset with my pronunciation. Um, in, a, in a brawl, he got into a fight and he murdered this person. And so he had to flee Rome. Uh, 
so he was not, you know, a super nice guy. Uh, at one point, Caravaggio uh, had a death warrant issued for him by the Pope. Uh, the Pope actually put out a death warrant against him. Uh, he used everyday people in his paintings, including prostitutes and people from the lower class, street people, uh, anybody he could come into contact with who would be willing to pose for his paintings as models for his paintings. Uh, this upset many people because a lot of the patrons of the arts at the time were the church and the government. They would be the ones buying his paintings and, and those of other artists. And so, of course, they did not like to hear that the models that were used for the figures, particularly in religious depictions, were, you know, prostitutes and street people. Um, so he was a pretty controversial person all around. Uh, his career only lasted 13 years. Uh, he did not paint for very long, and he did not live very long. And so he had a very short career and yet produced quite a bit of work. Now that is the backdrop for our discussion about seeing versus looking. We're going to use one of his paintings as our, our discussion point for the discussion. So the painting is The Supper at Emmaus. It was painted in 1601, and you can sort of see the timeline here. He passed away in 1610. He was on the run for murdering somebody in 1606, and so he finished this painting only a few years earlier in 1601. This painting is often considered the high point of his career in terms of both his painting ability, his ability to uh, construct narrative and use metaphor and leave lots of questions for the viewer in his painting so that you, as as the viewer could help interpret the story that he's trying to tell. Now, of course, a lot of his paintings were religious in nature because that's who the patrons were, that's who was purchasing his paintings and, you know, keeping him employed. Um, but he did not try to make the idealistic, perfect version of the Bible stories. He tried to make them as realistic as possible. So this here is the painting. Now you're going to have an opportunity to really study this painting. So again, it's called The Supper at Emmaus. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything about it in terms of its background or what it's all about. You can certainly do your own research. But the goal of the discussion this week is for you to really look closely at this uh, painting. Now, of course, seeing versus looking is meant to be a bit of a play on words, but really, even though we use those words interchangeably, hey, I see something, or hey, I'm looking at something, really, they're different. One of those words implies that you just acknowledge that something exists within the visual sphere, which in the visual field, and you move on with your life. You're like, oh, look, there's an apple. Okay, I know what that is, and I keep going, right? Um, but then truly looking at something requires sort of analyzing it and thinking about it and using your critical thinking skills and being able to ascertain what the larger, more detailed story might be about something. And so one of the things we talked about early in the semester when we were looking at all those pictures of apples is it's one thing to say, oh, it's an apple. That's, that's just sort of, you know, looking at it quickly. But to really see it for what it is you have to delve deeper into it. Remember we looked at that photo of the apple hanging on a tree in an orchard and it was wet and then we started to construct a narrative around it and ask a lot of questions about it and then try to follow those questions. Well, it's the same type of uh, exercise that we're going to do here. So on its surface, this painting shows four people, uh, four male figures, around a table. Uh, it involves some kind of meal. Of course, the name of the painting is The Supper at Emmaus, so it's obvious that this is a supper or a dinner, uh, as it were. Um, and of course, those words are used differently, so you can certainly check the history of those words and see the difference between, say, supper and dinner. And there's certainly food involved on the table, um, but something else is happening. Uh, each of these characters has a role to play in the story. Each of these characters has a background. They have their own history. Uh, they may have names. Um, the composition of the painting, meaning the way in which the figures and the table and the food and even the wall in the background are set into the painting all mean something. Uh, there is a place uh, left open at the table. Um, who is that for? What's that all about? Um, everything down to what are the specific food items that are on the table and how are they positioned on the table? What is the clothing that these people are wearing? What is the condition of the clothing they are wearing? What about the colors, the expressions on their faces, their body language, and so on and so on and so on. So 
At first glance, it's easy to say, well, four people around a table, they're having some kind of a meal. That's just sort of looking at it quickly. But what we're trying to do here is really see it for what it is. There is a story going on here, and there are lots of hidden details. So it's your job to try to figure out what those are and reconstruct the story and really analyze what's going on and really don't leave any stone unturned, as they say. Uh, so that's part of your discussion. Now let's look at the actual instructions on a discussion board. So we're going to open this up here in discussions and we'll take a look at what it says. So again, there's a reproduction of the painting right here. If you want to see a larger version of it, you can just type in Summer Adama Supper Adamaeus into Google and look for a larger version. You can find lots of really nice versions of this, but uh, it'll give you a chance to really check it out. So uh, again, there's a little bit about Caravaggio right here, which we just sort of went over in our overview about him. Um, and so there is a little bit about the painting. We get one line about the painting. So Caravaggio's Supper at Emmaus shows a scene from the Gospel of Luke 24 where the resurrected Christ appears to two disciples. Now that is essentially what was given to Caravaggio as his sort of directions in what to paint. So whoever hired him to paint this, that's what they pretty much said. I want a scene from the Gospel of Luke 24. So it's obviously a Bible scene, a religious scene. That's all we know. There's a whole lot more story in there. So your instructions are based on what we learned in our week one lecture when we were really talking about looking deeply at those apples and trying to construct the story and find out what's going on behind the scenes and what every little detail means from the colors to all the other things going on there. Spend some time analyzing and really seeing the painting above, the Caravaggio painting. Take note of all the details a couple times over. Uh, and for the discussion, you're going to write two paragraphs that respond to these two prompts. So you're going to try to answer to these two prompts. Uh, number one, describe in great detail all of the physical attributes that you see. You can break it down by person, by object, however you want to do it. Be sure to use clear, descriptive language that makes it easy for your readers to follow along while looking at the painting. You have a 250 word minimum for this section of the writing. You can write more if you'd like, but at least write 250 words. So this is what you see, what you what is physically available in the painting. You're going to describe all the details. So that's just what do you observe, okay? That's part one. Part two, you, based on the details above that you've just written and figured out, you're going to ask and answer some questions about each of the four people depicted in the painting. This is where we start to analyze the story that's going on, and you get to interpret it based on your own critical thinking skills. So some questions you might want to answer are, who are these four people? Why have they come to this place? Uh, what are they doing here? What do you think they do for a living? What is their financial status? What does their body language say about their mood and or their thoughts? If we could hear them speaking, what might they be saying? Be sure to ask and answer questions of your own as well as these. Those are just some ideas. There's lots of things you can ask about this. So be as creative as you can. Ask as many questions as you want, um, including, well, where are they exactly? Is this a restaurant? Is this somebody's house? Uh, you can also ask and answer questions about the food and the objects in the painting, what their relevance might be. Don't skip over any details. So basically all the physical details that you describe in part one, you can then ask questions about in part two and then try to answer those questions to the best of your ability. Um, you might answer all the questions. You might leave some just hanging as questions and that's okay because this is a discussion. We'll get to that in a minute. So part two is also a 250 word minimum. So at minimum you're writing about 500 words here, uh, which is about a half a page worth of writing. It's not that uh, it's not that big. Now again, you can write more. Do not stop yourself. If you have more to say, say it. Now then of course once you've made your initial post, you have to respond to at least two classmates uh, their initial post. You have to comment specifically on their analysis from prompt two, discuss your thoughts and reactions to their analysis in a th thorough and thoughtful manner. Do you agree or disagree with their analysis? Did they think of things maybe you didn't think of? Does some of their ideas correspond with yours? Have a discussion about it. So you have to respond to at least two classmates. If you want to respond to more of your classmates, that's good too. This is meant to be a rolling discussion. This is why you have all week to work on this. Now you can sit down, analyze the painting, answer the questions, and get the whole thing done in an hour, and then you're done with it. But that's not really putting a lot of work into it. I want you to really spend time thinking about the painting, 
write your initial post, and then think some more about it, and then go back and respond to a couple of classmates. Now, of course, to respond to a couple of classmates means you have to read their posts and then think about what they said. So this is why you have the whole week to work on it. Don't breeze through this. The ability to really see things clearly and analyze it requires some time. So maybe do a little bit on one day, come back and do some more. You can always work on it in pieces. Uh, as always, all discussion posts have to remain civil, articulate, academically minded, free of inflammatory language. You can disagree with your classmates, but you cannot argue with them and be rude to each other. Anybody who does that will have their post deleted and you'll get a zero for the discussion board. Now, I'm just saying that this one time. I don't expect anybody will actually engage in that kind of behavior, but I'm telling you anyway. Now, of course, the guidelines for the discussion are below. This goes for all discussion boards. It is due at the end of the week, Friday by 10 p.m. So you get all week to work on this puppy. All right, so that is your seeing versus looking assignment in discussion one, where you're gonna get to really implement some of that uh, visual literacy critical thinking skills. Okay, now the other thing that's due at the end of this week, also Friday at the end of the day, is step one of our semester project. Now the semester project, of course, is the semester long genre deconstruction and reconstruction project where we are gonna choose a classic movie or television show and you're gonna reimagine it. Now step one is the part where you actually do the choosing and the reimagining. Eventually, by the end of the semester, we're gonna make a title sequence for this newly imagined show uh, or movie. But right now, step one, you are going to uh, actually pick one and reimagine it. Now, you might have already started on this, but it's due at the end of this week. So step one is to reimagine the classic movie or television show. Choose one of the classic movies or television shows below. You have a list to choose from. You can't just pick any one you want. You have to pick one of these. Uh, and you're going to reimagine it as a completely different genre and subgenre. Um, uh, earlier in the assignment, last week or so, we talked about genres and subgenres. So if you don't remember what those are, uh, you can look at the links down below here and sort of figure it out. So if it says next to each one what their original genre and or subgenre is, and then you can turn it into a completely different one. Try to pick a, a new subgenre or a new genre that is very different. So turn a romantic comedy into a horror movie. Turn a science fiction movie into a comedy or something like that. Try to give it some, some contrast in terms of how much you're going to change it, right? Now, you're going to start by reading the original synopsis for the show or movie that you choose. And all these links down here link you to the synopsis. So you're gonna read through those. You might be familiar with some of these shows or movies, maybe you're not, I don't know. Um, but at least read through the synopsis and then that'll give you an idea of what they're all about. Then, once you've decided on which TV show or movie you would like to reimagine, um, and you've read through the synopsis, then you're gonna write a one-page plot summary. Now remember, plot summaries and synopsis are, are different. A synopsis is long and detailed, and a plot summary is exactly what it says. It is a one-page summary. It's just an overview. Uh, so you're going to write a one-page pl plot summary of your newly imagined movie or TV show. You have to keep the original title of the movie or TV show. You have to keep the names of the major characters from the movie or TV show. And you have to keep the basic premise. But that's it. Everything else you can completely change about it. Um, it can take place in a different time period. Uh, obviously, you're going to change details that will match up with your new genre choice. Everything else is completely fair game. So your choices are one of these four television shows, The Fugitive, which originally aired from 1963 to 1967. It was an action-adventure show. Adam 12 uh, aired from 68 to 75. It was a police procedural. Uh, Bewitched uh, aired from 1964 to 1972. It was a fantasy comedy show. Um, and MASH, uh, airing from 1972 to 1983, was a comedy, drama, historical fiction. Uh, that one had lots of genres and subgenres. If you see the slash, the first one is the genre, and then the subsequent ones are the subgenres. Um, now, your movie choices are either Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which came out in 1977, which was science fiction, Gloria came out in 1980, which was a crime drama, When Harry Met Sally came out in 1989, it was a romantic comedy, 
and The Birdcage came out in 1996, which was a comedy. Now, all you have to do before you start rewriting your plot summary and with your newly imagined uh, genre and subgenre is to read the plot, uh, to read the synopsis. However, if you want to go watch the TV show or movie, if you can track it down somewhere, go do that. That'll help make it even easier for you. Um, but that's entirely up to you. So at minimum, read the synopsis. But if you can get an opportunity to go watch it, that would be even better. Again, if you're not clear on the genres and subgenres, these links will take you to a list of comprehensive genres and comprehensive subgenres. Remember to check out the class's writing guidelines, which you can find on the front page of Canvas before you start actually doing the typing, and then you'll be good to go. These, of course, are photos from the or some of the original ones. This is from The Fugitive. This is from Bewitched. This is from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And this photo is from When Harry Met Sally. All right, so that is due at the end of this week is your one-page plot summary. But, of course, first you've got to do some research. You've got to read through the synopsis and then come up with a really creative way to reimagine it into a new genre. Go crazy with it. Have some fun. If you want to get a little help from your classmates and maybe collaborate on some of these ideas, you are welcome to do that. I love when students work together, so you can certainly do that. All right, so that's everything for this week. Practicing with our seeing versus looking on our discussion board and getting step one of our semester project all done. And, of course, be sure to watch this TED Talk. It is super interesting. All right, that is that for the week. I will see you soon.